for, for your for your greeting and for your welcome, and for uh, inviting me to be here uh, with with you today. Uh, one of my children uh, asked what, what I was. Or one of the grandchildren asked, "What are we doing today?" And I said, "Well, I'm talking about traditional independence." Does that take a whole day? And my wife said, <laughs> "My wife said it's taken him 43 years." <laughs> But, but it is a, a, a fascinating topic. Judicial independence is so that we can do not what we want, but what, what, but what we must. Um, and then this has to, this has to be un, un, understood. And we do it against the background uh, of the separation of powers uh, under the federal constitution. Uh, the, the great innovation uh, in the Constitution, the structure one was federalism. No, no one had ever heard of it. And the idea that you have more freedom because you have two governments instead of one, it, I mean, it only gives you intellectual whiplash. Um, but separation of powers, uh, the, uh, the framers um, did understand uh, the, the, the heritage, uh, uh, the, 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 the meaning, the, the history, the purpose, the power of the courts. Um, one of the common theories today was, was that they didn't say much about Article Three, uh, but they incorporated a, a tradition uh, that, that begins at least with, with Magna Carta, uh, that the law comes from uh, the, the people to the government, people to the king, not, not to the women. Um, uh, 300 years later, uh, Lord Cook had his famous uh, confrontation with, with King James. King James had a little time on his hands, and so he called Cook and said he'd like to be a judge in a few cases. And Cook said, well, uh, the, uh, our tradition is that this is only, only for judges. And the, the king said, the law is based on reason. Hath their majesty no reason? And Cook said, uh, your majesty uh, is, 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 a, is a learned man, but not learned in the laws of this, our realm of England. But the discussion didn't get any better. And finally, the king gets angry, and he slammed his fist on the desk or whatever kings slam on when they're married, and they're angry. <laughs> and uh, he said, the king is under no man. And Cook said, the king is not under no man but he's under God and the law. Uh, it said subdeo et uh, sublex. Uh, Cook was quoting Bracton, who'd written that in the year 1250 or so, uh, in, a, in a way indicating the king. It says, uh, Mr. King, I have a precedent on, on my side. Um, and, then, and then we have the English uh, we, 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 we have the, the, the Bill of Rights of 1689. Uh, we, we have Cook uh, in, 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 Dr., in Dr. Bonham's case, uh, which was discussed by Blackstone. You know, Blackstone, uh, uh, the commentaries, uh, was the second biggest selling book in the colonies right after the Bible. Uh, we were a legally literate people. Uh, we couldn't afford to have barristers and solicitors, so we had a unified profession, because you couldn't have all the guilds and a new, uh, just like you couldn't have a silver guild or a leather guild, you couldn't have uh, solicitors and barristers. Uh, but this was a very, very powerful tradition. And Federalist 78, uh, Hamilton's explanation of the importance of the judiciary, and I, it's, it's in my interpretation, of, a, a, a fairly strong defense of, of ju judicial review uh, was understood by the framers. And this is part of the structure uh, that, we, that we inherit. Now, judicial independence, uh, because of this history, uh, is difficult to uh, establish in other countries. Now, other countries want constitutions like we do. What are you supposed to say? Well, you have a Magna Carta, then you wait 400 years, and you have, and you have the, uh, the, 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 the Bill of Rights, and then you, and then you uh, have brilliant people uh, who uh, 
elaborate the law like Blackstone, and, and, then, you, and then you have a, a revolutionary war, and you wait, and then you have, after about 10 years, or 1787, you, you have a constitution, uh, and then, then you have to have a civil war. Uh, no, no, they're, they're entitled to a constitution now. Well, what about, what about judicial independence? Uh, the, uh, Judge Krauss mentioned my, my, going, my going abroad. Uh, it was because of a combination of circumstances. Uh, President Putin, when he first came into office, uh, asked if uh, he, he could see me he, because uh, his uh, chief of staff knew me. And he, he, he said that he had three uh, principal objectives. Uh, one was to fix the tax system, it was broken. People were paying some of their taxes in vodka, it was just broken. Uh, the, 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 the second was the uh, Russian judiciary system was broken. They'd issue an order that you can't collect this tax between uh, two certain states, and they were collecting it the next day. No, no command and control. And third, he wanted to reinstate uh, Russia's power in foreign affairs. Um, and so uh, we, we, were, we were pleased to meet with some of his judges, and we identified two or three really brilliant, wonderful judges, familiar mostly in the civil law tradition, not the common law tradition. And uh, we, we, we talked about uh, what, what, what Putin was doing and what they suggested. Uh, for, for judicial reform. Uh, he, he fired a third of the judges and raised the salaries of all the others. I told him to phone President Bush and tell him how to raise the salary. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, so we thought perhaps this was a way to use the judiciary uh, to begin, to begin uh, a, a foundation for more freedom. Uh, within three years, these judges were in my office, my in my chambers, in tears. Uh, he'd reform the judiciary all right to make it more efficient uh, for, for the rule of an autocratic government. No judicial independence. In fact, almost, almost the reverse. Uh, Judge Krauss mentioned China. I didn't know she was going to mention that. Uh, China, uh, many of us thought in uh, late 19, uh, 1990s or early 2000s uh, that maybe there was an opening uh, for a better, better idea of, of freedom. Um, and uh, the uh, Prime Minister, Premier Zhu, told me, he said, you know, he said, in, in the United States, or, or in, in, in China, uh, we, we, we begin cons with consensus, then we have debate. You begin with debate, and then you have consensus. Uh, now, you can't argue with heads of state you know, too directly, but I said, that with all due respect, uh, Mr. Premier, uh, we too begin with a consensus. And it's a consensus that the law protects the freedom of our people. That's our consensus. Uh, and for Americans, I think there is a general understanding, not as articulate or as well-founded as it ought to be, uh, that the courts do protect individual rights in, in specific cases. Um, now, in, in Hong Kong, um, they asked me, Governor Chris Patton was governor at the time, to look at the transition uh, agreement um, that uh, China was going to sign with, with, uh, with Great Britain. And uh, it, it seemed to me that the provisions for the high court, which is basically the highest court in the high, high public court in Hong Kong, were a little too weak, and they were good about accepting some of my recommendations. Um, within about three years, the Hong Kong High Court had their Marbury versus Madison moment. Uh, the question was, the, and, and the question was, could the Hong Kong Supreme Court declare invalid a statute passed by the People's Republic in Beijing? Uh, it was unlike Marbury versus Madison, and it was a very important case. In Marbury, nobody cared about Marbury became the judge. In fact, in fact, Jefferson thought he'd won the case for a while, uh, until he realized that it established judicial review. Uh, this case, uh, this case, this case was absolutely uh, vital because it involved uh, the rights of uh, relatives on the mainland to, to visit um, and, and stay with uh, Hong Kong residents and uh, 
The, Beijing didn't was horrified by it. The Hong Kong the people were horrified, at it. and the, 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 the chief executive of Hong Kong was terrified. I said, you know, I said, really, I said, you remind me of, of, of Reagan when he was governor, and, and he liked that. And, 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 uh, I said, because there'd be some court decision, uh, and I said, you, you can find a way to work out. This is, this is a law, but you can find a way to work with it. Well, they didn't, and the Hong Kong Supreme Court backed down. No more with the versus Madison. Um, the, the discussions today make, make it clear uh, that there's a structural component, a structural necessity uh, that undermines, that, that underlies, uh, that underwrites, uh, that, that secures and, and, that's, and that supports uh, judicial review. And that is a profession. The bench, the bar, and the academy are all united in making the case system work so that the, the, so that the judicial review is a, is, is a reality. Uh, in our system, we give, oh, and, and this is in, in Hungary about 10 years ago, uh, it was necessary for the courts to completely revise they're basically their equivalent of the federal rules of criminal procedure. And they were just having a big problem with it. And I, I said, well, why don't you just have a, a, a committee, either formal or informal, of uh, representatives of the bench, the bar, and the academy, and you, you, you make it. The idea that they would sit and talk on a substantive issue with uh, other branches of the profession was just not un unheard of. Then. In, in most of the, in the civil law countries, uh, where there's no graduate law schools, you know, there's only four, four countries that have graduate law schools, uh, or about four countries, uh, South Africa, US, Canada, Japan, that's it. Uh, and you decide in the civil law system at a very early age whether or not you're going to go through the government route to be a judge, begin as a hearing examiner or whether you're gonna go into private practice, they never meet, they never cross. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is nationwide. And so in, and so in Hungary, that this idea that they, they could meet and actually together uh, give assistance uh, in, in developing a rule which, which is com completely, completely not open. For us, it's, it's, it's a matter of course, it's a matter of, 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 of con convention. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of professional pride, uh, and, and we have uh, we, we, we take many of our judges from the ranks of the, the academy or the, or, or the private practice. There's this transference, and this is why uh, there's a structure. There's a structure that underlies and that reinforces and, and that supports. Uh, Judicial and uh, judicial independence. Um, we give reasons for what we do, uh, and those reasons over time uh, will convince many people uh, that initially thought the court might be wrong, but maybe that's right. If people say that the court is, is, is anti-majoritarian, that's true. It seems to me only in the very short term. Uh, in the long term, it seems to me the court is majoritarian. <coughs> Most of its decisions are accepted as correct. Uh, one of you asked me to re repeat the story. Uh, one, of, my, one of my first uh, cases was the, the flag burning case, Texas versus Johnson. Um, there was some man, he was a, some young man was angry at something. I don't know if he was angry. He burned an American flag in, in Texas. And the case came to the Supreme Court. A rather interesting, as so we've been talking about divisions, political division. This was a generational division. <laughs> Stevens, Rehnquist, White had fought in, in World War in, 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 in World War II and carried the flag. Um, and, and there's a, 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 the, the, the fourth, I think it was uh, uh, Justice O'Connor was on that side. Oh, I forget. But then there were five of us. Uh, 
who, who thought that this was a First Amendment violation. And it seemed to me necessary uh, to write a short concurrence because uh, it was clear to me uh, that this decision would be in the short term, very unpopular. So it's just over the weekend or 48 hours I wrote a short concurrence uh, indicating that uh, it's poignant but fundamental that the flag protects those who hold it in contempt. And, um, and I told my colleagues that, you know, this is going to be a very controversial decision. Well, it came out, and I think over 80 senators uh, uh, took to the floor and denounced the court, and President Bush, 41, took the week off and went to flag factory or something. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and the editorial commentary was, was uh, much of it, much of it, not all of it, much of it strongly supportive of the dissent out of the court. But over time, people began to think. And the Constitution, uh, and this is what judicial independence is for, the Constitution should have relevance in our own time. And uh, a few months later, my children uh, were still living in California. And uh, we were there to uh, able to meet them. And we were having breakfast at the Universal House of Pancakes. And, uh, <laughs> Some young man came over and he, and he said, uh, are, are you Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court? And I thought, was this some C-SPAN junkie that watches the budget hearings? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he said, I see with your, 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 your family, but I just want to tell you about your flag wearing case. He said, I'm from a small town, Ukiah, California, which is a very small town in the far north of California. And he said, like you, um, I'm, I'm a private practitioner, like you were, solo practitioner like you were for a long time. And um, my father never comes to the office. I had clients in the office. He came in with the San Francisco Chronicle reporting the flag burning case. And he threw it down. And he said, you should be ashamed to be an attorney. Uh, he said, I didn't know what to do. He said, so I, I gave him a copy of your concurrence. It was short. And he said he came back three uh, days later. And uh, I knew that why he'd been angry. He'd been a prisoner of war in World War II uh, in uh, Germany uh, for over two years. And the prisoners used to take little pieces of red, white, and blue and make a flag and pass it around and the guards would find it. Uh, and he said that's why he was so infuriated. But he said, after reading uh, the concurrence, he said, you can be proud to be a lawyer. That's, that's the way a reasoned decision-making process should work. Uh, we need to have a, a system uh, in which the reasons that the court gives for its opinions, the way it becomes really majoritarian over the time, over time, um, the reasons that it uses to command allegiance to its decisions uh, become become critical in the support of the court. Uh, in the cyber age. We have a huge problem. In my view, the cyber age is the biggest revolution as the Enlightenment has changed the way we think about thought. Uh, it changes the, the way we communicate with each other. Uh, we don't have civil conversation. Everything is, everything is present or future. We bypass uh, Walmart. Uh, we bypass uh, newspapers. Uh, we bypass political parties, uh, but we can't bypass our heritage. And our heritage is in large part the rule of law. And this is the structure uh, that the profession supports uh, and the reasons that you've heard today um, that, that, that are essential for judicial independence to, to, to continue. A judicial independence requires not only a structure, but it requires a personal commitment, an individual ethic on the part of each and every judge. And that individual ethic is for the judge to ask himself, to ask herself in every single case, what is it that is driving my decision? What are the reasons? 
And if the judge decided the same case a month ago, he has to ask himself the question again because he's given an oath to that litigant that he will listen to the litigant's case. Now, of course, there's precedent. It's of, of, of tremendous importance to the system for reasons that have mentioned, been mentioned. Of course, there's precedent. Uh, but still, the judge must ask, why? Why is this going to be my decision? Uh, the, 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 the younger generation, I, I don't think, knows the movie Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Um, uh, it's a movie uh, Spencer uh, Tracy and, and Catherine Hepburn. And um, Spencer Tracy lives in San Francisco. He's a newspaper editor, a very thoughtful man. Uh, and he has just, I think, eight hours uh, to give either his, his consent or indicate his lack of consent to his daughter's marriage to a, a, a talented, very spiritual, wonderful black man. Uh, uh, Sydney party, Sydney, Sydney party. Um, and uh, he, he's finally, he has just this terrible day. Uh, people yelling at him from all sides. So finally he's by himself. And he's on the terrace overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge. And you can see him thinking. And he thinks through, he's asking himself, what are the reasons that's driving my decision to lack, to, to give my lack of permission? And he thinks and he thinks, and he says, well, I'll be darned. And he realizes that he was wrong. That's what judges have to do every day in every case. That is what judicial independence presumes. That is what judicial <coughs> independence requires. Now, the, 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 the concern uh, that we, we must have, and many of the speakers have mentioned it today, is the state of our civil discourse, the state of, the state of our political discourse, uh, especially given the internet. It's very important for us to have a decent, thoughtful, progressive, rational, respectful, civic dialogue so that we can define the, inter the, the cyber age before it defines us. Um, and it's very, very important that we have this so that we can continue to explain uh, why our heritage should continue the heritage of, 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 of law. Uh, Aristotle, uh, as, as did Plato as well, gave a very low grade to democracy, the lowest grade. He classified different forms of government. Uh, monarchy, oligarchy, aristocracy, democracy. He gave a very low grade to, to democracy. And in, in many respects, um, Aristotle has, has always been an intellectual hero of mine, and Plato as well, although he had some wacky ideas. <laughs> um, and so, so a couple summers ago, I reread Aristotle. I said, why, why, why didn't he like democracy? Um, and it, it, the conclusion I drew is that he did not think democracy had the capacity to mature And it's our destiny to prove him wrong. And one of the ways we prove him wrong is by the judicial independence that secures the rule of law. And that's what we've been talking about today. We have to continue talking about it for our professional lives and for the rest of our people and for a very fascinating uh, and, and enlightening day. Please accept my thanks. Justice Kennedy, you've been very fortunate in your law clerks, and we have another one of your law clerks here today who is also on the Third Circuit, uh, Judge Bevis, and uh, the two of us will be uh, having a 
a brief discussion with you. He didn't do what I told him to do when he was my law clerk. You better do it now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you have said that you want to go quickly to the audience, and so we'll, we'll do a, a little bit up here, but then we'll, we'll take questions um, and maybe a, a little bit of comment, but not a lot of comment, just questions, and uh, you want to mix it up, I think, and so that'll be great. Uh, so um, you, are, do you have any reflections on some of the comments that were made about the, the, the court today? Um, I think you, you. I think you were there at lunch, and uh, Paul Clement and Kathleen Sullivan both thought it would be a good thing if the court would take more cases, and uh, and also uh, perhaps dial it back a little bit. I don't think they said it quite that way, but somebody else did on the dissents. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you have uh, thoughts about any of them. Uh, well, um, when I first came to the court. Uh, we had 160 cases. I said, these people are crazy. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, by a, a, April, uh, you, you, you were lucky to be able to read it. And Harry Blackman wouldn't change a comma after April 1st, so he had to write a concurrence, then he'd make the change. <laughs> um, and uh, so 150, and then 160 was just far too many. Uh, 100 was about right so far as our workload. Uh, 75, 80, number one, we're puzzled. But it might be that the internet age, the cyber age is working. Uh, it's easier for the attorneys very quickly to find out if there's a conflict, to see what the, what the uh, controlling precedents are. It just may be that there, there, there are fewer conflicts. Why, it's not clear to me. Um, it does seem to me that one of our functions ought to be um, to have an intelligent use of uh, judicial and, and legal resources so that the profession uh, is not engaged in arguing an issue in every district court in many, many circuits when they know that issue is going to come to the Supreme Court. So it seems to me we may not, if we can see an issue like that, perhaps we shouldn't wait for a split. We should just take the first circuit case because we know that it's a difficult issue. And uh, we might as well save everybody's time to, to resolve it. We do need standards. Uh, some years ago, there was an airline crash case with a verdict of, I don't know, hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars. And it seemed to me quite wrong. And it seemed to me that maybe we should take the case. But then it occurred to me, well, what's the standard? Is it a lot of money? What about the woman in the social security system that has a bad back? and, 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 and the, hearing examiner is clearly erred in ruling against her. Did you take that case too? We need standard. Um, and you know, the usual standard is uh, the state, if the federal statute is declared unconstitutional or if it's a, a, a split between the circuits or the Supreme Court. Um, so, so we are, the, the court is, is looking at to see whether there are other standards, but it can't, it can't be one in which just, uh, oh, it seems to me this case is wrong. Oh, that, that, that's, that's, that's not good. But there could be a court after us say we were wrong, and then a court after that say they were wrong. That, that goes on forever. But it, it, does, it does seem to me that the court should take more case. Uh, we, it's tempting to say, oh, the cases today are more complicated. Mm, I'm not so sure of that. Uh, we did have the DNA case a couple of years ago. I spent all summer reading about DNA and the double helix one way. Um, and, and some of the patent cases that Professor Yu in the intellectual property area are very difficult. Uh, it's not clear to me that the cases are any more difficult now than they were 50 years ago. But, um, but it, the, the, court, the court is very interested in why there are fewer cases. We're asking that something. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So uh, Judge Beavis, you've, you've been on uh, the court, the Third Circuit here, for almost two years. And it might be interesting just to know sort of how a, a young judge gets acculturated into the values of the judiciary and to judicial independence. Well, I, I think what's, what's interesting is uh, I had the privilege of clerking for Justice Kennedy 22 years ago, and so much of what I learned, I learned by example, and those who clerk for the justice are very loyal in part because we, we learn by example. And there's one example that, 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 that stuck in my mind, but it also tees up how hard it is to to communicate this in a mass market kind of way. There was a case we had in which 
Justice Kennedy was having me help him in, in authoring an opinion, and, but we needed a, a, a fifth vote. And there was another justice who was the person we were hoping would vote, and this other justice had another opinion that was going around. I asked the justice, well, does this opinion need to wait for that opinion to get this other justice's vote? And the lesson I got back was very swift and unequivocal. Was, no, no. He pointed out his window at the, the, the dome of the Capitol, it was right across from the chambers. He said, that's the way they do business over there <laughs> in Congress. They, they do log rolling. We, we don't trade votes here. There's just no, there was no hesitation, no question. And so I had the privilege of learning by doing one-on-one. -on -one. And from what I've heard today, the, the, I've heard a lot of stories that are very powerful, but how, when we can't sit down with every eighth grade child and show them how we're doing our work, how can we communicate this broadly? Because I'm in the school of thought that statistics don't explain it, that you know, media, are they going to get it right? Are they going to understand or impute motives? How can we communicate this when we can't do it all retail, working at Justice Kennedy's right hand? Well, you know, even, even in law school, I wanted to ask Professor Burbank, um, it seems to me we ought to talk about judicial independence uh, more than we do in law school. You don't have a, a course on it. Uh, in some cases, um, important subjects fall between the schools. Um, uh, Self-incrimination right. Uh, the common law professors think the evidence that people teach it, uh, the evidence people think the civil procedure teaches it, nobody does. <laughs> and, we send out, and we send out attorneys who don't know the rule of waiver. So they'll allow, while their clients go on the stand for a few questions, then, then invoke the Fifth Amendment. No, it's waived. Uh, so you, you, this falls between the school. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's always seemed to me that every course by every professor should spend at least one hour with a legal ethics problem in it. Um, now, how we talk about judicial independence, I'm not sure, you know, federal courts, civil procedure, constitutional law. Uh, but it seems, it seems to me, since you're using the case method so often, uh, that we ought to talk about the mindset that goes in to the writing of the case by, by the judge who uh, in, insists on judicial independence for, uh, for, for the judge's integrity. So, so many of our students have the opportunity to clerk or to extern with the judge, and I think they get a, they get a lot from that. You did something um, some years ago that maybe you could talk about, which is your rule of law bookmark, because that, that has had a fair amount of traction. There it is. <laughs> Funny I should ask. Oh, and, 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 uh, I, I used to teach in, in China, uh, to visit for, for a week, uh, and uh, teach some of the principal uh, uh, universities over there. And one time, a student, and everything in China's numbers, so this class had probably 1,500 people on it. Uh, raise your hand and, and said, uh, what do you mean by the rule of law? And for years I've been saying, I'm Justice Kennedy, I'm going to tell you what the rule of law is. <laughs> uh, and I never thought about it. And in, in China, uh, three is a lucky number, four is an un, un, unlucky number. I said, it has three parts. Uh, <laughs> and and I, 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 I said, uh, number one, the government is found by the law. Number two, the law protects human dignity. And number three, the law is accessible. And later on, the UN adopted it as the definition of rule of law for the uh, uh, empowerment of the poor committee. And it's been translated into a whole lot, this is German, a whole, a whole lot of language. It doesn't have um, the word democracy in it, because if the Chinese see this, then they'll see that, they'll throw it away. But it has the theory of democracy set out. Um, and uh, we, we, we ought to think more about uh, the components of the rule of law. And uh, it, it does presume a law uh, that's enforced in, in, in a neutral, logical, rational, thoughtful, fair, meaningful way, and that's why we have judicial independence. But, but as I was trying to say in my remark, judicial independence is, is so hard to, to transfer. Uh, but we can't say that we're the only ones to have it. So we have to think about it more so the rest of the world can think about it. And the rule of law book works. Helps that, I think. 
The only other thing I would add is, as, as a new judge, learning to explain my opinions, it's, it's challenging when you have a complicated case and realizing that people may just read the introduction or the conclusion and try to explain some very technical areas of law in ways that show your reasoning, show your, your work so that people see this is not just fiat or what I would like. This is, this is deduced from a series of principles and it's not that we don't, as judges, personally have feelings or viewpoints, but that's not what driving, we're not allowing ourselves to be driven by whatever our, it, 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 my colleagues have taught me, you know, we can appreciate the plight that people are in, but we don't talk in terms of raw feeling or raw sympathy or empathy. It's, it's filtered through rules. And there are other institutions like juries that have maybe a broader role, but, but, but our power comes not from force or will, it comes from judgment and showing people our, our, our judgment. And Justice Kennedy is always, as you can see, a masterful speaker and really inspiring in being able to con convey that sense that it is coming from a place of, of judgment and not from, not from will. Well, the, the, um, Holmes, one of the, panel, one of the panelists, I think it was in the last panel, said that the law is a, uh, the ca a case is a story. Holmes said, the law is a story of our moral life. Uh, and when uh, uh, young people visit our, uh, our chambers and see the books on, on the wall, uh, we say those are, those, are, those are real people that did real things, some of which were right, some of which were wrong. This, this is a story, the law, the law is a story. And the judges are committed to tell it in a neutral, detached, thoughtful way uh, so that it teaches. So, Justice Kennedy, you, you've, uh, you've just been tireless, really. It's, it's, it's awesome when you think about it. You do so much at home in education of young people, and then you've done so much abroad. And uh, I, I'm focused for the moment on the, the part where you've been abroad. And you've done, you've, You've done that from the very beginning of your judicial career, because I know you, um, you and I were both in the Ninth Circuit, and you, you had the the uh, portfolio for the uh, for American Samoa, and I think maybe in the Marianas as well, Guam, and you you kind of cut your teeth there, and then you went on to have this this extraordinary <coughs> international experience, reaching out to to other judges, and it would be. Um, it would be good if I think if the American people could have some greater sense of how our uh, system differs and is related to uh, foreign systems. It's very hard to convey. There, there, is, there is a bond and a kinship uh, among judges everywhere. Uh, they're in the same profession, so they, they do the shop talk about how low their salary is and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and how they wish the lawyers had helped them more. And, so they, and uh, in, in China, when we talked talk to the judges, it, it looked to me like there might be an opening uh, uh, again uh, in the late 1990s for uh, uh, some idea of judicial independence, maybe use the judiciary as a forerunner for the idea of freedom. Um, and we would talk to the judges, and they knew that you knew that they knew that you knew that we didn't think they were independent. But one of the things, <laughs> one of the things um, that uh, it seemed to me had uh, real merit that some of us suggested was that they uh, make public all of their uh, capital sentencing cases. In part, then we would know how many people were executed in China. Um, but for that very reason, the uh, government stopped it. But we were very, very close to getting it. And, but there is an urge by judges in many countries worldwide to, to, to be uh, to, to have our, our degree of to have our degree of independence, and it's very very difficult uh, for, for them for them to achieve. So let's go and, to and, the. But let me just say that when, in in in, in our country, uh, the Congress has been very generous insofar as resources for the court, uh, courthouses, uh, the federal judicial center, uh, the, the number of. of, 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 of uh, sentencing uh, uh, pretrial probation officers we have, uh, provision for juries and so on. Uh, uh, very, very generous with, with judicial resources. The salaries are different. Oh, you know, it's very interesting. Churchill, I don't know why I read it, but uh, Churchill gave a speech in 1954 
uh, he was in his second term as prime minister. Uh, on judicial independence, uh, the uh, House of Commons was reluctant to raise the judge's salary because the judge's was tied, salary was tied to the members of the House of Commons, something that federal judges in our country are familiar with. And uh, Churchill gave a beautiful speech, and he said it would be a slur on the reputation of this house. Uh, and it would be devastating to the character and the integrity of, of the judiciary for us to link their salaries and for us to deny them their salary because we cannot raise our own. In 1948, uh, uh, pardon me, 1954, he said that. Uh, but, and he was careful about knowing that there are certain limits on the idea of parliamentary supremacy. Uh, in 1948, he was in Amsterdam, where they were discussing the beginning of the drafting of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and it was pretty clear that there was going to be a European Court of Human Rights, which there, which there now is in Strasbourg. Uh, and he made it clear that um, he thought that the English uh, government and, that, and, and signatory countries uh, should be subject to uh, the uh, jurisdiction of the, uh, this transnational su su Supreme Court, provided it, were, it was limited simply to personal liberties. Uh, he was very, very thoughtful for that. So, so, he, so even the English, which has this tradition of parliamentary supremacy, they, 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 they understood, eh, maybe they were convinced by Cook and Dr. Bonham's case, who talked about judicial review, uh, that, there, that there is this role for the courts. Shall we go to our audience? Are we ready? Okay, so I'll need, I may need a little bit of help seeing out into the sea here. Who wants to go first? And yes, here we go. Is there somebody there? We're, we're holding the microphone, so okay. any well, questions? How about a student? How about a, a Penn Law student? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Justice Kennedy oh, awaits uh, you. We have one right here. All right. Justice Kennedy, thanks a lot for speaking. Uh, first of all, I just want to mention on a technical note, you said the, you mentioned a few countries with independent judiciaries. I just want to note that Israel also has a very independent judiciary yeah. uh, in line with the U.S. Um, how does a judge in a country that's so divided between two large political camps hand out over such a long term period of ten, tens of years so many decisions that, hang, that anger both camps, basically, whether it's gay rights in the Second Amendment, the Hawaii case, and your decisions on other uh, civil rights issues, these things might have le uh, left you pretty much unloved by both big political camps. How does a person, when they embark on their judicial career, do uh, chooses such a judicial course that might isolate them from the, the, the two big ecosystems of American social life? And I don't think that's what happened to you, but that's something that could have happened. What's the decision-making process there? Thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's something that's important for me to think about. Um, it, 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 it seems to me that uh, the public respects uh, the idea of judicial neutrality. And if you can, by the reasons you give, by the approach that you take, by the language that you use, um, by the civility that you try to exhibit, uh, show that you've made the decision in, in good faith and uh, that you're interpreting a, a constitution uh, in, in which uh, we, we, we all have a critical stake. Where, um, Americans are I was so fascinated by the, by the last panel where uh, only immigrants, or mostly immigrants, identify themselves as American when asked what they identify themselves with. But it does seem to me that when push comes to shove, uh, the Americans identify with, with, with the Constitution. And, uh, and the Constitution ought to have meaning in our own time. Ought to have meaning in our own time. 
And uh, if you can indicate that you are protecting something that belongs to all of us, uh, then and, and in good faith, um, and that, in my view, as indicated, over time we're majoritarian because of the reason we give. I, I think that's a that's a, that's a, a way in which, uh, over the long term, uh, the judiciary gains gains respect. I don't, I don't know if I've quite. In my chambers, I have a, a tribute to Justice Kennedy from Justice Gorsuch in the Harvard Law Review, and it's open to this page where Justice Kennedy told Justice Gorsuch when he first became a, a, a circuit judge, I think, uh, praise and flattery are, are sirens, false sirens. Don't, don't heed praise, don't heed criticism. Um, I mean, I think substantive arguments, of course, we should listen to, but that desire for approval or that fear of criticism, that's why the, the oath that he administered to me when I was sworn in says that we will do justice without fear or favor. And it's why Article Three of the Constitution gives us life tenure and salary protection. And our job is to have thick enough skins to ignore the criticism and not be swayed by the, the flattery. Uh, it's, it's tempting to say that uh, our decisions are somewhat more controversial now because they involve social issues. Um, you know, the first time, uh, and, 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 and provision of the Bill of Rights, the first time uh, the Supreme Court declared a statute invalid under the First Amendment was 1932. Now, of course, we had the Alien Sedition Act, but that never came up in the court. Uh, and the first time they declared a federal statute unconstitutional under the First Amendment was 1946. And now we have the, 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 the social rights, the meaning of liberty has expanded. Uh, the nature of injustice is you can't see it in your own time. Uh, but uh, the judiciary uh, tries to identify those instances. So I, there's a temptation on the one hand to say, well, we're res resolving more issues of more country. Well, the Bank of the United States was a very controversial issue. <laughs> and McCulloch versus Mary. Uh, slavery, hello. Uh, so uh, it's not the first time the court has, has uh, in, in the, oh, incidentally, what's the first case after Marlboro versus Madison where the Supreme Court held a, a statute unconstitutional. Dred Scott, 50 years, uh, half a century later, uh, and and now it's it's and now it's it's now it's now it's routine. Um, so it, it's tempting to say that the social issues that we're engaged in, issues that none of us would have even knew even knew about um, 15, 20 years ago. Um, are more controversial. I'm, I'm not sure historically that's accurate. Um. I think part of the question was also whether you found it took a personal toll, whether it was isolating or whether it's just difficult to be always in the, in the middle of controversy. Uh, well, I, I, each, each of my, my colleagues um, Look, looks, looks, looks at every case in, 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 their, own, in their own way. People, uh, you were very gracious not to, to, to say that I was the swing boat. That, that, has, that has this uh, visual image of this <laughs> going back and forth. And, and, and I say, look, the cases swing, I don't. <laughs> I think we have a question up there. All right, up there. I wanted to just say thank you, first of all, for coming and sharing. It's wonderfully exhilarating. As someone who works with young people, we do mock appellate arguments all the time. And it is, I think, a great way for young people to learn about it. What the Rendell Center does and what Judge Rendell has done um, is just fantastic. But Justice, I'm curious, just does it tickle you in your 80s to be trending on Twitter because of what Mayor Pete has said? that he'd be looking to have justices like you to appoint. And do you think that people who are, and there are people who are angry with you that you retired because they counted on you to keep the court from swinging too far one way or the other way. Do you think there's any real concern for that or do you think the court with just the sense that it has when Justice Roberts has talked about, Chief Justice Roberts has talked about the importance of the court being non-political um, trying to keep its place 
as really a, a bastion where we can have civility and we can have decision making. A lot of things asking here, but I'm just curious just what your reaction is to it all. Is it something that you expected? Is it something that you, um, you know, just dismiss? Are you even paying attention to any of this discussion around your role and how we miss you on the court? Well, uh, to, to begin with, um, uh, it, was, it was important to me. My, my wife had hurt herself and, and needed me. Um, and, and it's hard to uh, leave something you love, but not if you do it for something you love more. Um, and uh, for 40 plus years, beginning of September 15th, I was reading briefs, and I'd finish around June 30. Uh, and there was 425 hours per year at home reading briefs, or 450 hours. And uh, now, and you can't talk to it about your spouse, so now we have wonderful evenings together. So that's been important. Um, the, the confirmation process uh, is something that we don't comment on. Uh, uh, my, my nomination was after Bork. Uh, after Bork was denied, then my nomination was made. And I thought, whoa, now this is good because there's, what, three weeks or four weeks of Bork hearings I can watch on it. I watched for about 30 minutes. I said, I'm not going to listen to that stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, I, I didn't think at all about the, the confirmation hearings or even about who, who might be appointed. Uh, the president, of course, did ask me a, a, about the background of some of the people who were being considered. Um, but uh, the, the, the course uh, traditions and, and history and um, its etiquette, um, I think, are already, it's already visible in, in oral argument that the judges, the justices all have great respect for each other. And, and, and over, I think, time, a short period of time, it will become clear that there's a collegiality on the court that rises above these momentary divisions. I think we, we have, have a, one more. Maybe. We have a question right over here. Wherever that is. Uh, thank you, Justice Kennedy, for being here. So you mentioned uh, the internet and technology and how it's reducing the quality of discourse. Uh, so what role do you think that the legal profession and the judiciary have in shaping uh, internet and cyber law, and how do you think that uh, we should change the structure of the internet, and how do you think that the judi judiciary should play a role in that in order to improve the discourse? Oh, well, many, many things in, in, uh, in, in your question there. No, no, number one, it does seem to me that our, the nature of our discourse has changed because, as, as indicated, uh, it, it seems to me that we have this emphasis on the present and the immediate, and we cannot bypass our, ha our past. We cannot bypass our heritage. We cannot bypass uh, America's destiny uh, to have freedom for itself, that it looks uh, uh, as an example of the rest of the world. And we must remember that our civic discourse uh, is what other people judge, judge us by. And the verdict of, on, on freedom is out halfway around the world. Uh, and they're looking at us. And so it seems to me very important. Now, the, you, you can't expect the, the, uh, the political branches or Congress uh, as a whole to use the language that the courts do. The language of the law uh, has, a, has an elegance, a, a, a balance, a symmetry, a, a, a boundary, a limit, a dimension, um, a, a beauty, a poetry that the, the other language, that the language of the social discourse doesn't have. We can't expect everybody to teach, speak like lawyers. It would be a boring place if they did. Uh, on, on the other hand, we can set the example that we use this language of the law. Uh, we use this tradition of civility in order to have thoughtful discussions with each other. Um, and, and, and it seems to me that that's a vital importance. Now, another part of your question, it seems to me, is that uh, we, were, we were talking about it earlier at, at lunch. Um, uh, does the uh, cyber age uh, give us new issues in the whole area of the First Amendment? Absolutely, yes. If you'd asked me five years ago, 10 years ago, has the First Amendment been settled? I'd say, we've settled the First Amendment. Now, we'll have difficult cases, whether you can uh, protest that a uh, 
serviceman's funeral and so forth. Those are very difficult people. Uh, but we, we know the, the basis. Internet, you know, new, new world. Uh, the, the whole idea that uh, you, you do something uh, quite accidental, but it looks freakish, freakish and, and, you, and you go, what is it, a viral? Um, that, uh, I, I tell people, this, this is confidential, but <laughs> you can watch baseball while you read briefs. <laughs> <laughs> My wife liked it, so we'd watch baseball. But it was not long ago uh, that there, are, and the camera occasionally focuses on the on the spectators. And it started to rain, and the man had this plastic slicker, and he put it on his head. Only he put his head through the right armhole, and then the the neck and those were over here. So it was going like this. So he spilled all the beer and the hot dogs over here. And I mean, this thing was just arrived. Now, for the rest of his life, people are going to say, are you, are you, are you the man that was in this thing? Um, this is a huge First Amendment problem. Uh, and we're just beginning to, to, to understand it. it, it it's, it's a new world. And uh, it's completely unsettled. And what the issues are going to be, how the issues are framed, or what is it, their right, right to be forgotten? Is it right, right to be forgotten? Um, uh, these, these, these are issues of fundamental difficulty and of great First Amendment importance, and it's a new era. It's a new era. And uh, it's difficult for me to uh, predict the shape even that the issues will take. But uh, this is a new world that we live in. Justice Kennedy, it's always a joy and an honor. Thank you for your service.